Well, we're starting a new series today called The Hope of Christmas. So would you turn in your Bible to, guess what, chat, what book? Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And while you're turning there, I just want to give you a little context. So Mary was most likely a teenager. So you got to kind of get this, get the picture in mind of what she was like. Uh, she was probably making TikTok videos. Uh, she was practicing her handwritten Joseph and Mary and nice swirly fonts and little underlines and frames and block letters and all caps and lower caps and just really enjoying writing that because she was betrothed to Joseph. Some of our modern translations say engaged. She wasn't engaged. She was betrothed. That means legally they were husband and wife. They were just not living together yet. Uh, they wouldn't stay together until Joseph, her, her husband, her betrothed, gets the house ready. Once the house is ready, then they can have that, mar- that final marriage ceremony, and then they get to be together, live together as, as man and wife. So that's what's going on down here. But behind the scenes in heaven, Jesus was getting ready to come to earth. And reading between the lines, I bet the angels were speculating, hmm, how is Jesus going to come? So when Jesus takes on flesh and blood, is he going to, like, just go and show up, ta-da, as a holy man? Or is he going to, like, just show up, pizzazz, like a celebrity? Or is he going to show up with authority, like an army general or a president? Like, how is Jesus going to first step onto the earth? Will it be, like, a king? They're speculating But God the Father, he knew the time, the place, the way. And so he called his favorite ambassador angel, Gabriel. He was an ambassador from heaven to earth. And he said, Gabriel, come here. Come here. I got a message. I got a message for a young teenage girl named Mary. And so then God the Father said, go. Luke chapter 1, we find Mary in her room, polishing her nails creamy blue. (laughs) Nail polish color of the year. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, this is what it says. Gabriel, that angel from heaven, appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now, Gabriel's words are very positive. So... You know, we kind of tend to picture, picture we, you know, we picture it like not as a person who is there. I'm trying to get you to be able to picture it as a person who is there. So these words sound very positive, but the appearance of an angel in your room, I believe that it probably freaked Mary out just a little bit. And actually, the Bible supports it. Now, Gabriel obviously meant no harm. He, he, was, he was one of the good guys, <laughs> angel from heaven. So as Mary realized that, she began to rack her brain to remember all those Old Testament stories. That's all she would have had. There was only the Old Testament, no New Testament yet. Uh, those Old Testament stories of angels showing up. So she's probably remembering, oh, yeah, an angel showed up to rescue a man named Lot once and his whole family before their city was destroyed. Hmm. Another time an angel showed up, there was a man named Jacob who wrestled with an angel. Very strange story, but it's a very symbolic story. But he wrestled with an angel until the angel finally said enough, and he touched Jacob's hip and and kind of made it out of joint so that he walked with a limp the rest of his life. That might sound bad, but that limp reminded him of his encounter with heaven. While they're wrestling there, Jacob says, I I want a blessing. And the angel ends up changing Jacob's name. You know what he changed his name to? Israel. Have you heard of Israel before? It's a whole country. It started with this guy. Actually, it started a little before him, but the name started with him, Israel. Uh, she's thinking back to other angel encounters. Well, an, an angel, actually a little group of angels, told Abraham that he and his very elderly wife, Sarah, were, they were going to have a son. And so she's thinking about all these, uh, uh, all these just flashing through her mind in a second, all the, those different encounters where heaven sent an angel to earth. 
So she probably saw a pattern that when it comes to God's people, angels came to help God's people, not to hurt them. But the Bible says that Mary was confused and disturbed. That's what the, NLT, the way the NLT translators translate it. Most other translators call it greatly troubled. So we have this picture, I think, that you know Mary is just like, oh, great, angel in my room, no big deal. He gives me this big news, no big deal. No, I think it was a very big deal. This is a teenager painting her nails uh, creamy blue and milk chocolate brown. Every other one. <laughs> and an angel comes into a room like this. This is like, what? This is freaky. Uh, the Bible says that she debated in her mind and tried to reason through what this angelic visitation could mean for her. I'm going to pick the story back up in verse 30. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. And if I had a nickel for every time an angel told someone, don't be afraid. <laughs> because it's scary when an angel shows up. I, I, I did a little, uh, uh, so just some, some reading on angels this week. And it was very interesting. Uh, someone, just a, a scholar type person, did a little study on the strangeness of the angels. And his theory is that they're going to be much more bizarre than beautiful because uh, they've got eyes here, there, and everywhere. Sometimes they're shaped like a wheel. Sometimes they got wings covering their feet. Like, they're, they're interesting people. So I don't know what Gabriel looked like. We picture him blonde, blue-eyed, curly hair. <laughs> I don't think so. I, 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 it's, I, it's a guess, but I don't think so. So he starts by saying, don't be afraid, Mary. Uh, for one thing, he just kind of zapped right into her room. So, I mean, that would make you afraid. He said, for you have found favor with God. This, he begins to really get into the meat of his message from God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, Savior, Deliverer, Rescuer. You will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay, young teenage girl making TikTok videos, painting her nails. And the angel comes and says all this. Wait, what? Mary thought, I'm going to have a baby, a king, the Son of the Most High God? But I'm a virgin. I still live in my parents' house while Joseph is getting our, our future home ready. Mary hopes that somehow God is talking about giving her a baby through Joseph. Like, she's trying to figure this out. But if not, I mean, she just can't get pregnant out of wedlock, even if it's a miracle. I mean, what would her parents do to her? What would Joseph do to her? Well, going down to verse 35, the angel replied. She, she asked the angel, what is going on? How can this be? The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy. That is set apart, unique in its own category. And he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say Elizabeth was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. And if you're reading the NLT, you'll see a little asterisk there with a little note down at the bottom of the page. In Luke uh, uh, 137, in the Amplified Bible, another translation, it says that same verse 37 is written this way. For with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God, if you're, if you're a, a scholar, no rhema from God, shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. That's what, that, that's what that, that verse is trying to communicate there. Uh, in the NIV, it's just simply translated, for nothing is impossible with God. Can we say that out loud? For nothing is impossible with God. Wow. 
the sense here is that there is not a thing that God cannot do. There is not a thing that God's word cannot accomplish. There is nothing in that category of impossible for God. So Gabriel said, in effect, I can prove that nothing is impossible with God. I mean, he's here telling this teenage girl, most likely teenager, he, he's here telling her that she's going to bear a, a son uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll be a king, a savior, the ruler of the world, the son of the most high. Like, wow. And he says, but I can prove that nothing is impossible with God. He says, your elderly cousin Elizabeth, who was diagnosed years ago with infertility, is six months pregnant right now. That's impossible. And she is elderly, way past the childbearing years, just as God promised her husband, Zechariah. And so the angel is basically saying, Mary, go check it out. If you want confirmation that nothing's impossible with God, why don't you go pay Elizabeth a visit? Wow. So Mary is thinking this through. Oh, her head is spinning God is giving me some kind of a miracle baby. Like for us, we've heard the Christmas story a million times. She's never heard it. This is all new. Every detail, she doesn't get it. She doesn't know what, what is going on. Uh, she's thinking, God has given me some kind of a miracle baby. My life is over. We all think, oh, she said, oh, wrap a blue towel around my head. That's so beautiful. <laughs> that, that was not how it went down. She is greatly troubled. She's thinking, my life is over as I know it. This was a situation totally out of Mary's control. So what's she going to do? She could run away from the Lord's mission like Jonah she'd read about in the Old Testament. Or she could try hiding from responsibility like the first king of Israel, King Saul, did on his coronation day. Or she could argue with the angel and insist that he pick somebody else for this mission like Gideon once did to an angel. What's she going to do? We've been living in an impossible situation for almost two years now. It's been two years of pandemic and pandemonium, both together, each caused by each other, and each separately. Life as we know it, like for Mary, life as we know it has been turned upside down. And it seems like the craziness is not over. Jobs are threatened and finances are scary. The media, can we just be honest? The media is constantly sensationalizing the virus and its variants. Uh, so it's really hard for just regular people like you and me to even know what is the truth anymore. What, what is the truth? Because it seems like there's just such a desire to make everything a catastrophe or a, uh, or a, bit, you know, a big sensational thing. The government seems to be trying to take tighter and tighter control of our lives. And I don't mean just the U.S. government. I don't know if you've heard of what's going on in Australia. Oh, my goodness. And around the world. Like, there's just so much going on right now. School has not been normal for a long, long time. And it's had an effect on the kids. It's hard. Do you, when your life is feeling out of control, do you feel like running? Do you feel like hiding? Or do you feel like arguing with God? Does life ever seem hopeless to you? And I got to admit, there are times when certain aspects of it do seem hopeless. Like, I don't see how this is ever going to get turned around, humanly speaking. Imagine how Mary felt if the Holy Spirit does overshadow her and she does become pregnant, as the angel said would happen, who would understand that? Who would believe that? She would lose her reputation. Most likely, she would lose her marriage. And in that day, in that era, she would have no way, really, to take care of herself. If her parents turned her out, she's done. Like, there's no more food. You would think that her situation was hopeless. It's too hard. How could anyone survive this? And yet, we read in Luke 1.38, her response to the angel. Mary responded to Gabriel, I am the Lord's servant. 
May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now, remember, she is not looking back. She, she's not been singing Christmas carols all her life. There are no Christmas carols left uh, yet. There, there are no Christmas carols. Like, the Christmas hasn't happened yet. She's asked a couple of questions of the angel. I'm sure it still makes no sense to her. But yet, Mary had hope. Hope is confidently looking forward. It's expecting good and beneficial things to happen to you. Mary had hope for good things because her faith was in God. Faith is a little different than hope. Faith is grounded in a person or, or in some, if you're not a Christian, in, in, in a situation. But for us, faith is, is grounded in the object of the faith. It's God. Her faith was in God, so she had hope. What is faith? Faith is belief, trust, and commitment to obey. That is one of the best definitions uh, that I've ever heard of for faith. Belief and trust and a commitment to obey. Mary believed God's message to her through the ambassador, Gabriel. She trusted God to take care of her, even though this did not make sense Felt like she's just jumping off a cliff. And she made a commitment, a new commitment. She renewed her commitment to obey whatever God asked of her. She said, I'm your servant, Lord. This sounds crazy. It sounds hard. I don't know if I'm even going to make it. But if you're calling me to do it, I'm in. Wow. That is inspiring. And that tells you, you can see God saw something in Mary. She's much more than a teenage girl polishing her nails. She was a teenage girl polishing her nails who believed in God, who trusted in God. And that is awesome. May we have many teenage girls painting their nails and trusting in God in our church. Amen? Why not, Pastor Christian? Don't you say that? Yes. Amen. Well, God did some crazy miracles for Mary. The Holy Spirit did overshadow her. It's the immaculate conception. It is miraculous. He enabled her to conceive while she was still a virgin. This is impossible, except nothing's impossible with God. And good news, Joseph did marry Mary. And that's where the group came from, Mary Mary. Joseph did marry Mary, and her reputation was spared. Praise the Lord. I'm sure there was some lifted eyebrows, but he took her to her post-haste. Uh, and the, the Bible's very clear, no wookie wookie until after the baby came. <laughs> God, God sort of working in her life as if, you know, the miraculous angel wasn't enough. He just kept doing miraculous confirmations. And Mary had the ultimate joy and the privilege of raising the Son of God. That is amazing. What, what a privilege. She was favored above all women to have that honor and that privilege. The bottom line of this message is very simple. God is your reason for hope. Amen. God. God is your reason for hope. Not anything else in, the world, in this world. Not wishful thinking. That's not your reason for hope. Not denial. Not hiding. That's not your reason for hope. Not having all the answers. That's not your reason for hope. Many times we wait to have all the answers before we take a step of faith. But that is not... Where your hope is, your hope is not in having all the answers. Your hope is not in counting on your leaders of any sphere of life to make life perfect and easy again. Your hope is not found in giving up or in giving into fear. Your hope is not found in stewing or stressing about your situation. God is your reason for hope, and He does not change. We sang about that today. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are true. That's why I want to keep speaking his promises to you and over your life. Let's claim those promises. Let's hold on to God because God doesn't change. Our world is changing like we've always been saying since the information age. Our world is changing so rapidly. But, oh, my goodness, this year, wow, <laughs> exponentially changing and you just don't even know what ends up it feels like you're walking on a floating island if there were such a thing but god but god remains the same Amen. jesus said in fact if you hear my words and you obey them you put them into practice 
It's like you just built your life on a rock. Your life's on a rock. And it doesn't matter what storm comes, what mandate, what disease, or what situation. It does not matter because God is your rock. No, th- not those things. Amen? Not those things. In John 16, 33, we have the words of Jesus. Jesus didn't stay a baby, by the way. He grew up. And this is what he said. One of the last things he said to his disciples was, Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And that is good news right there. Jesus never promised it was going to be easy. And it is so hard right now. It is so hard. It is. There's just, there's no getting around it. It is so hard. Jesus said, yeah, I, I said that was going to happen. You live in a broken world where people make sinful choices, and that leads to hard times. It leads to persecutions. It leads to all, just all kinds of things. But take heart, Jesus said, because I have overcome the world. Why is he delaying his coming? Because he's getting our house ready. <laughs> That's what he's doing. And he is giving time for every person to have an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So he's just delaying a little bit, but he has overcome. So your action step is just simply Jesus' words today. Take heart. Take heart. Take heart. Jesus is the ultimate overcomer. You don't have to be the ultimate overcomer. You can rest in Jesus. You can walk in his overcoming, in his victory. Jesus, what did he overcome? He overcame rejection, abandonment, physical pain, poverty, temptation, and the cross. Yes, he took the punishment for your sin in his body on the cross so that you and I could walk in spiritual victory. Overwhelming victory is ours. Like I say, I've been to different. I've been to different countries. I've seen people in very different living conditions. Uh, material wealth in the bank is not the only wealth. I can just tell you right now. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. The Bible says. Jesus gave us his spiritual victory. He gives us eternal life. And eternal life is the free gift of God to anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus for it. That's the good news. Eternal life. The free gift of God to anyone who believes in Jesus for it. In Romans chapter 8, I wanted to quote the entire chapter. It's so good. But I just chose one verse to wrap this up with. Romans 8. 31 to 32. I'm kind of starting in the middle of the verse. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Someone shout out, no one. <laughs> no one. If God is for you, who can be, ever be against you? No one. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? He's going to give you what you need to get through this season. He's going to give you what you need to overcome in every trial, temptation, and torment. He's going to give you what you need to overcome physical issues, abandonment, rejection. Jesus has gone through all that, and he knows how, and he has the power and love to get you through it. Would you stand to your feet if you're in the room and online? Would you make where you are a place of prayer? And we want to pray. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? And let's pray. Pray is talking to God and listening to God. That's the simple, simple definition. Prayer is talking to God and listening to God. We take, take just a second and listen. Let's listen. Just a minute. God, our Father, our Abba Father, I just thank you and we praise you for sending Jesus to us. 
You've always cared about us. You made us in your image. You've always loved us. It crushed your heart when we sinned and rebelled against you. You've always had a plan to bring us back and redeem us. You loved us that much. And Father, I thank you that the way you showed us is you yourself, your only begotten Son, God the Son, Jesus, took on flesh and bones, flesh and blood, to walk with us, experience everything from our point of view, and show us how to put our faith in you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for, for giving us the story of Mary so we knew what was going on with her. And I thank you that, that you, uh, your gospel writer, Luke, was honest enough to say that she was greatly troubled. It was hard when she heard this news. Her life was turning upside down. And Lord, I thank you that when our lives are turning upside down, you are there. Amen. You, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough to make it through, even if you don't take that thorn of, uh, out of our flesh, like another part of the Bible talks about. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your power is made perfect when we are weak. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is sufficient to get us through and to even make us thrive in the worst seasons. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With your head still bowed, if you are just in need of God's grace to get you through, <laughs> Maybe it's a specific situation. Maybe it's just life in general. But if you just like prayer, oh, I need God's grace. Would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. Lots of hands going up. Man, there's, I know it's so much. It's so much. Lord, you see our hands. And Lord, I just pray right now that every one of us would receive your grace. Lord, when we're tempted to complain, would you fill our mouths with gratitude to you because there's always something to be grateful for in you. You've done so much. Lord God, when we're, when we're tempted to be tempted, Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand and after the battle to still be standing firm, Lord God. Lord, when we're tempted to give up, maybe, maybe uh, quit on our job or on our marriage or on you even, or if we're tempted to give up on everything and end it. I just pray, Jesus, you would come in in that moment. Lord, don't let us give up. Don't let us give in. Don't let us end it, whether it's a relationship or even our very life. Lord, don't let us end it, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would show that person who's been thinking thoughts like that, Lord God. I don't usually pray this way, so I, I believe you're leading me. Lord, for that person that's thought, I think it might be easier to end it. Right now, Jesus, 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 come. Pour your Holy Spirit in them. Just carry them in your big, strong, loving arms. Pick them up. Take them through this hard time, Lord God, and get them through it. Your grace is enough. Even in that situation, Lord, I pray that you would be our hope because you are really our only reason for hope. Lord God, that you would be that person's hope. Lord God, for the, for the person that's just, it's just everything right now. Lord, I pray for your grace. I pray for a smile that does not make sense to anyone around us because it's a smile that comes from you. I pray that you would, oh, that you would flood our lives with your joy, love, and peace. Because you are the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Could you just begin to thank God for peace? Thank him for grace. Thank him for healing. Thank, you for, thank him for sufficiency. Thank him for survival and thrival. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I praise you, and we receive it, Lord. We receive your grace and mercy and peace. We receive your hope. We receive you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. I want to stay in prayer for another moment. I just want to give you an opportunity to put your faith in Jesus. I, I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey, but if you've, if you've never put your faith in Jesus or if you've wandered away from him, I just want to invite you 
to trust Jesus, to put your faith in him, to believe he's who he says he is and that you're in need of a savior, to trust him for salvation and to commit to obey him. How do you do that? Turn from your sins, turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. If you're, if you're putting your faith in Jesus today for the first time or you're coming back after wandering away, would you just raise your hand right where you are in this room? I'll see you and I'll pray for you. Heads are bowed, but just raise your hand if today you want to give your life to Jesus. And online, would you raise your hand to God? I'm still going to pray for you. I just can't see you right now. Lord, you see every person that is making a decision today to put their faith and trust in you. And Lord, I pray that right now as they pray and they ask you to forgive them of their, of their sins and make them new, Lord God. I pray that you would come in by your Holy Spirit, that you would help them, Lord, to not only believe, but also to trust you and obey, to follow you like an apprentice follows a journeyman. Help us, Lord God, to move forward in faith and in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And, and if you made that decision, whether you're in the room, if you're in the room, just check the, the box on the back of the Connect card. Give me enough info on the front that, that uh, I can just send you one encouraging email. Uh, but check the box on the back so I know you put your faith in Jesus today. And online, just follow that same uh, QR code to the Connect card, and you can fill it out there. Would you ever, would everyone be seated, uh, if you would, please? And the first miracle today is I was done before 1143. I want to invite you today to join uh, my wife, Pastor Shelley, and me. Join us. Join uh, your other pastors. Join your other church leaders in giving today in a very special Christmas project offering. It just comes once a year where we, where we do something a little bit more significant, where we stretch for something significant. It's I, I've got to make clear, it is an offering above and beyond your regular tithes or your regular giving. Otherwise, it's just moving it from here to there. But we're, we're actually receiving, like uh, Pastor Shelley and I, we gave significantly above our regular giving already. We already gave uh, in this offering uh, in, pre in preparation. This offering goes to meet two important needs. First is to, pro to provide 500 Christmas gifts to kids and families in, in the Auburn School District. Those kids have been chosen by their counselors as kids with a significant need this Christmas. And we get the opportunity to actually fulfill their wish list. They requested specific needs. And I've never seen so many requests for coats. And we've gotten some beautiful quality co coats uh, that, that we're ready to, to give out. Coats, boots, and blankets. That, that's the thing that kind of st struck me. There's a lot of need for warmth physical warmth this year. And those are the needs the kids are asking for. And then they ask for all the wants, the Legos, the dolls, and the soccer balls, and basketballs, and footballs, and just all that stuff. We get the opportunity to provide that for them. And uh, we, we've learned, this is our, we've done it now three or four years, we've learned now we get gifts for all of the members of that household, all, all of the kids, 18 and younger, in, in a given household. So it's not just the elementary ones that are getting something. We, we're giving, uh, some parents have asked for diapers. We're giving, we're getting diapers, a car seat. Uh, oh my goodness, it's so awesome what we get to do. The second great need is to provide new flooring for the worship center right here and the lobby. Two different kind of flooring. This would be carpet. That'll be luxury vinyl plank, LVP. The carpet is approximately 30 years old. So it'll be, I guess, 32 years old, something like that. So it is time. It has served us well, and it is time to renew that because this is where we minister to the community. I wish we could have it done before Saturday, but that's, that's not going to happen uh, when, when the community is coming in. But I have some good news for you. How many love to hear good news? I love to hear good news. Yes. A few of our leaders and pastors have already given sacrificially, and I, I can report to you today that we are already a little over halfway there to our goal of $30,000 because we're leading the way. That is awesome. Praise the Lord. 
Now, uh, you might think, oh, great, if everyone just gives $10, we'll be there. But that's not how it works. <laughs> so to make it to our goal, that additional uh, a little less than $15,000 to go, some people would need to give significantly. It's, it just never works in a group giving. Everyone doesn't. We just don't all give the same. Everyone's got different abilities and different resources. So some would give more significantly, and everyone would give a little. If you feel like, I have got nothing to give, but you could give a dollar, I believe God will bless you for that. Amen. And the difference, it will make the biggest difference in your heart as you see what God will do, as you just step out and take a little step of faith. I honestly believe that. So how, how do you give? You can see the card on your on your chairs. I had a sample in here. Uh, there it is. A little red card. And you can give in your usual ways or you can uh, scan the QR code by just getting out your camera app. Online, uh, you can, uh, we'll be showing you a, a QR code for giving as well. Uh, or you can just give in your usual ways. While you're preparing your gift, I want to tell you the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He was a Roman officer living in Israel during the time period right after Jesus died and rose again. Cornelius believed in the God of Israel, but he wasn't a Christian. He didn't know that Jesus was the Savior of the world. He knew, he sensed, he believed that it was right to give gifts to the poor. And so he didn't just give little gifts. He didn't throw a, buck, uh, a quarter in the Salvation Army bucket. He gave generously. He gave generously. And God saw him, and God was pleased with those offerings. Now, that is very interesting to me, because this is a person who, who was not yet a Christian. He, he had not had that transforming uh, faith on the inside of him. Uh, and, and yet he knew it was right to give, and God said, I like a giver. I, I'm going to bless him. And so God sent an angel. There's that angel again. Sent an angel to talk to Cornelius. Can you imagine a Roman officer believed in God. He's like moving towards God. He didn't know about Jesus, but an angel comes to him. And, and then God miraculously, through very unusual means, directed Peter, the uh, apostle, that close disciple of Jesus, to go to share Jesus at Cornelius' house. In that day, Jews did not go into a Roman soldier's house. They considered it unclean. So for God to get work in Peter's heart to do that, that was a miracle right there. And Cornelius and his household got saved, and they received an amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They are one of the main uh, uh, things that we, uh, that we cite when we talk about how God's Spirit was poured out in the early church. It was poured out on Cornelius' house. His gifts to the poor... Moved the hand of God to pour out spiritual blessings and visitations and outpourings and salvation on Cornelius and his family. Why do I bring that story up? Because I just want you to know that God sees your giving. God is a giver, and he loves it when you give. And when I give, I am a giver. My wife is a giver. We are givers. We live generously. And I want to just encourage you with this. It's not so much the amount that God is after. What he's after is your heart. That is what he's after. It even matters to him your attitude. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, which is an attitude. Motives matter to God. Your posture toward God, your obedience, your faith, all of that matters to God. God sees your giving and whether you give a lot or give a little, God knows your heart. Amen? Amen. I, I'd love to pray. And we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. And I'm just going to pray over this offering. Lord, you see the need that is before us. It's a big need. It is a, it's a big stretch, a big step of faith for us, uh, Lord, to, to stretch out for this. But I know that because you've put it on our hearts, that you have all the provision we need. And so, Lord, I pray that you would move on our hearts. You've already talked to Shelly and me about what we're to give. Lord, I pray you would, you would talk to each of us uh, about what we're to give, Lord God, and help us to just simply be obedient and to do it with a motive of love. 
love for, the, for those who don't yet know Jesus, and love for your house and all the ministry that takes place in the worship center and lobby. Lord God, we give you our hearts first, and then our, our wallet follows right behind. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And Lord, I believe that we're going to see a miracle, a miracle in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just go ahead and serve. I know um, may, uh, not, most people are going to give in other ways, but perhaps some will give that way. And we call it the Christmas Project offering, but it doesn't have to just all be given today. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping to give some more as the month goes along. But by the end of the month, we want to wrap up the Christmas Project offering. God bless you, and thank you for giving. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, God blesses those who give. So I just I just thank you ahead of time for those who've given already, but also who are going to give today and throughout the month. He really, he will bless you and he will use you to bless others in our community. It's, that's just how God works. God's a God who loves other people. He loves people. All right. Well, it was so good to see you all today. If you, um, if you were new with us, just a reminder, pass one of your Connect card to an usher. Give it to me. I'll take it if you want. Um, we just want to connect with you. We want to walk this journey with you. And if you're joining us online, would you just hit that subscribe button? All that does, you know, we're not after likes and subscribes. We don't get like a high off of it or something. Uh, we, we, it just helps other people find our channel so that they can hear the good news of Jesus. That's why we ask you to do that. Um, for those of you who are in the building um, tonight, because we're doing the Christmas prep party, we would love your help if we could just move these chairs toward the walls. We're going to set up some tables, um, get it all ready for the prep party. We are preparing to prepare, preparing to prepare. That's how that's what we're doing right now. So if I could just have a, all of you, that'd be great. Um, and then I think that's it. Yeah, I think what we're going to do is we're just going to push the chairs to the side for now. We're not going to stack them just yet. Then we're going to bring in tables, and I'll direct people um, how, where to do that. And then we're going to put the chairs around the tables so we don't do too much extra work. All right. I love you guys. It's a blessing to see you. I'll see you next week, or I'll see you on the floor. God bless you.